Hello everyone, this is Sasha with the Law Practice Division. Thank you for joining us for honing the service side by bringing client voices into your firm or practice as part of the Marketing Mastermind Series. Our speakers today are Jill Zwetschkenbaum and Beth Kuzon. Thank you all for joining us. We'll now begin the webinar. Why, thank you, Sasha, Kristen, the ABA, and most certainly the attendees that are joining us today, whether it's morning or afternoon for you, it's still a Friday. So we appreciate it. And uh, thank you again. My name is Beth Kazone, and I am absolutely delighted to be here with my colleague, Jill Zwetschkenbaum. Next slide, please. What we're gonna be talking about today is so incredibly um, important to us that we co-authored a book for the American Bar Association. Um, and we're gonna talk a little bit, dig down deep a little bit today. So why don't we start with a poll and just ask if you have a program in place for client feedback. The results are on the screen right now. Um, okay, we have. 32% yes, and 68% as a no or not yet. Um, next slide, please. We really wanna talk about today why formal client interview or client feedback programs are something that you, your practice and your firm should care about. We wanna use some key data and risk scenarios to talk about this with you today. We'll also talk about what we see as the primary and most effective client feedback mechanisms. And then we will specifically dive into client interviews and talk about what the components and best practices are that make these incredibly effective. Uh, next slide, please. Great. And the numbers don't lie. Next slide, please. Awesome. So this is the perfect lead-in to talking about some of that quantifiable evidence of the importance of aligning your services with your client's expectations. So I really wanna take a look at that right side um, of, the, of the slide right here. And you'll see at the top of that darker bar and the difference between that bar and the lower bar. Um, these are all the key client service areas that represent things that clients say are most important to them. You can see below in that, in that light blue bar where clients stack up in, in where they think their law firms stack up in each of those areas. This gap between the two is extremely telling. More than 70% of clients here note all of these attributes around technology, staffing, and clients are important. Yet about 30% of law firms actually stack up in those areas. This disconnect, of course, impacts client satisfaction. Next slide, please. To keep going with some of this quantifiable evidence, I wanna call back up the areas that clients say are extremely important to them. Technology to improve productivity, greater collaboration and transparency between law firms, an increased emphasis on innovation. And I wanna now pull up the next poll to ask this group, is your practice or firm prepared for meeting these three expectations of clients in the future? All right, 50 and 50. And before we do hit the next slide, I do wanna say that this, um, these survey numbers are from the 2021 Wolters Kluwer Future Ready Survey on the, on the readiness of lawyers as we go past the pandemic time. The survey includes insights from 700 legal professionals across the US and in nine European countries. This survey examines trends as we talked about on how well-prepared organizations are as leading into the future and thinking about that higher performance that clients are expecting. So now, if we go to the next slide. You will see that when thinking about gearing up for change, more than 60% of firms believe they are not prepared to make changes to meet a client's needs when it comes to a range of key priorities for clients. Next slide. Thank you, Jill. You know, it's no surprise that um, if people, by the very nature of joining this webinar today, uh, that we've got 50% of attendees feeling like they're ready when the market is, uh, you know, just a little more than 30%. So 
this group is already outperforming the market, which is great. We also, because we started with some numbers, we figured that we would also include a few business um, you know, cases for you. If this is something that you're thinking about doing, whether you are a solo firm, small firm, medium firm, global firm, you know, you're trying to measure the risks and rewards of, are we going to do it? How are we going to do it? Does it make sense? So we thought we would put together just a little bit of a, we think, pretty compelling business case. You'll see the first two icons here that give you that 60% of legal decision makers have replaced their primary firm in the last 18 months. The number one reason by a factor of four is um, basically service. Clients are, are changing law firms because of service. And then we also know that you know, retaining clients will also save you money. Um, it costs somewhere between five to eight times more to obtain a new client than it does to keep an existing one and certainly grow it. Um, you'll also see on the right that clients want to see um, you know, firms that have diverse practices, meaning more than one service. That they can um, that they can use from the firm. On the bottom left hand corner of this slide is a little bit more of that. That actually, when clients have more varied legal services that they use a client for, they're less likely to leave. Um, and we've got some some interesting statistics there. When you think about more than thirty five percent of clients who use a firm for only one service leave within the first three years. So 35% of clients that only have one service leave within the first year. That 35% attrition rate goes down all the way to 15% when a client is using three services or more after three years. And not surprising, um, that 15% of client attrition moves all the way down to less than 5% of clients leave after three years if they have used four or five or more of a firm's services. Um, we also just you know, want to talk a little bit about just not forgetting that happy clients proves for more revenue, more profitability. Um, when you have a higher client retention rate, you're allowed um, and welcomed to charge higher, higher rates. You have a higher realization rate of what you collect. Happy clients are huge sources of referrals. And again, as we've already stated, it's easier to, to represent a client in an additional service than it is to go out and try to find a new client for an additional service. So I think I'm going to pause here, make sure we don't have any questions. And if we don't, we're going to keep moving. Great. Awesome. So great. Thank you. Um, I want to move into some table setting on and around risk. Next slide, please. Communication is the solution. This is one of the most iconic lines in the history of American cinema. For lawyers, communication takes on a whole different meaning. Lawyers are essentially professional communicators. I don't need to tell you that. And clear, transparent conversations and communication is a cornerstone to practicing law successfully. Next slide. Thank you. And we certainly won't spend too much time on the next few slides because we think that you know your uh, rules of professional conduct better than we do. But um, we wanted to just remind you as you're putting together your business case or thinking a little bit about this, that failure to communicate is the number one issue that clients cite in bar complaints. Um, we know that poor communication also has negative consequences beyond, um, beyond a complaint. You can have online reviews, there are chat rooms, things like that. Um, next slide, please. We're gonna just take, uh, this isn't a poll, we're just gonna take a quick self survey, meaning we just want you to think about these answers for a moment. We want you to think about your top 20 clients in your mind and think about what the response time 
is for a sensitive issue for each of those clients? Do you know with certainty that each one of those clients expect for you to communicate a sensitive issue to them within an hour, within a half day, within a day? Is the next working day okay? Is it sometime that week? And think a little bit about how do they expect for you to communicate non-sensitive issues? Do they expect that you're gonna turn around a non-sensitive update within an hour, half a day, a day? If you don't know with certainty that the, top, that the answers for your top 20 clients, we would say it's probably a good time to be thinking about how to bring the voice of the client into the firm and think a little bit about the expectations that they have so that you can meet them. And trust me, we have been in client interviews when we ask clients what responsiveness means to them, we've had people say less than five minutes, We've had people say same day. We've had people say same week. Um, so you don't know until you ask. And you know when we're talking a little bit about communicating, it's responsiveness. Clients think of communicating as your accessibility. They think of it as how quickly you respond to their requests. Um, they think about how quickly you're providing a matter or a case update. So these are all things, um, you know, that they think of when they're thinking about communicating. When there's, if you've ever had a client that's surprised by a bill, um, that's something that a client would say it was lack of communication, right? So those are just some of the things that we wanted you to think about as you're thinking about whether uh, you're going to continue the feedback that you have or if you're going to launch a client uh, feedback program. Next slide, please. And to add on to that, Beth, too, I think in the thousands of feedback conversations that we've collectively had and, and when we ask, you know, what is a quality that is most important to you, responsiveness is most likely 99% of the time the, the top answer that we receive. Correct. Um, client interviews can reduce the likelihood of a meritorious claim predicated on alleged failure to communicate. Next slide, please. And clients agree. Thank you. We've pulled some recent client feedback on client interviews and how much clients really value that opportunity to share feedback with us. You can press next, please. We'll pull up the four comments that we've represented here. And all of these comments represent multiple industries, roles, reasons for feedback, and more. And yet everyone agrees it's a critical and valuable exercise. And I want to pause here, A, to have everyone just take a look at the quotes and B, if anybody has questions before we jump into our next section on types of feedback, we're happy to answer some questions now as well. Great. Thank you. So there are, for the most part, six types of feedback that you can consider when you're thinking a little bit about how you bring the voice of the client in. The first one that we're going to talk about is surveys. The reason that law firms do this is it's most co cost effective, obviously. It really does give you the availability to also scale. Sometimes if you want to know uh, what your clients are thinking generally, um, these, are, these are great surveys. We've seen them happen online. We've seen law firms put them in bills. We've seen them send out a service, uh, an annual service survey that they can track and benchmark over time asking questions. So that's certainly one. The next one is called a follow-up loss discussion. And this is when you were being considered for representation and the prospective client decided that they would like to go with another firm. This is an enormously helpful uh, piece of feedback and they're called follow-up loss reports, following up to find out a little bit about why they made their decision and what you could or what your firm could have done differently. 
I would say in this particular one, trying to make it easy uh, for the prospective client um, is when we've seen the most transparency. So calling and saying, would love to hear a little bit about why you didn't select us and get on the phone and ask an open question like, what could we have done differently? Sometimes can be a non-starter. In fact, more often than sometimes it can be a non-starter. So you can ask some questions about what was it without telling me who the firm or the lawyer was, what was it that made you um, decide to go with a different firm or a different attorney? Are there ways that we could have answered things differently? Did the way we presented our information to you answer your questions clearly? Were our fees or our budget out of line with your expectations? I mean, so having some very pointed questions that you can then dig into and probe um, when you do a follow-up loss discussion. The next one is called an end of matter debrief. And this is also uh, in the marketplace called an after action review. And this is after you've had a trial or a hearing or a closing or your matter has come to an end, it's a really good time to reach out to the client to find out what did we do well? What could we have done differently? Were there people on the team that you enjoyed working with? Um, if you have a new paralegal or an associate that was working um, on your case for the first time, being able to get some feedback about him or her. It's also a good time just to talk a little bit about that responsiveness and accessibility that we had discussed earlier. Being able to ask, were we responsive? Were we accessible? Um, how, did, how do you like to get updates in the future? Uh, there are some clients who say, just send me an email. There are some clients that say, just send me an email with bullets. There are some that say, let's just get on the phone and talk about it. Don't send me an email. So um, that's a, this is a really good way to be able to get some of that information. And it's also a really nice way to lay the pipeline for understanding what some of their future needs may, might be and for you to make sure that you're positioning yourself as a subject matter expert or your firm as a subject matter expert when you're talking to them. The next one is what we call an, on the, uh, an, an annual off the clock, excuse me. And this is, um, we've seen for decades, clients really respond well to this. This is when you take time off the clock, nothing getting charged, to talk a little bit about what the client's strategic direction looks like. Are they thinking of selling? Are they thinking of merging? Are they worried about some regulatory things coming into play? Are there some state or federal regulations or changes in the law that might change the way they do business? Are they having some problems? It could be employment, it could be finance, it could be any host of things. And getting some understanding of where they are as a company and what some of those anticipated challenges are and how you might be able to help them. Again, even if it's off the clock, it could be introducing them to a new banker. It could be um, helping them find a CFO. You, you never know how you can help with, with these things, but an annual off the clock to sit down. And it's also a good time to say, how have we done over the last year? Um, especially if you don't do those after action reviews or end of matter debriefs that we just talked about. It's also a nice time to check in to see how happy are you with the services that we're providing you? The next one is an on the ground visit. And, you know, as we're starting to emerge from the pandemic and we're starting to see more and more uh, folks interested in face to face, this is something that before the pandemic was incredibly successful and helpful when lawyers took the time to go to their client's plant or their store or their office, walk around, you know, view properties, meet the people that they work with. And again, it's very similar to the annual off the clock, but it's meeting with them and learning a little bit about their culture as well. And again, this is a great time to find out a little bit, not just about them, but also find out a little bit about how you're doing. The last one is where we really wanna dig in 
over um, the next few minutes with you and talk about client service interviews. There are pros and cons to doing each one of these um, various types of feedback, but we truly believe that client service interviews you get the most value out of the client service interview, but sometimes it takes longer to wind up and it has a very long tail, almost a loop, if you will. So client service interviews are face-to-face, -face, whether that's virtually or in person. Um, and this is where you talk a little bit and get some quantifiable and quantifiable information from the client and when you're face to face with them and they are truly giving you a report about how you're doing, how your firm is doing, how your back office is doing, how are the support staff doing, um, and what other firms do that they work with that they'd like to see more of. And I think that's where we're really gonna do our deepest dive today. Next slide, please. So we started by giving you some numbers uh, that was, you know, a little bit of a business case of why to do it. We talked to you a little bit about some of the risk and service implications. We've talked a little bit about some various types of feedback that you can do. And so we're going to now talk about how do we close some of those service gaps using a client service interview. We'd like to think of client service interviews as an entire program and not a one-time meeting. Next slide, please. So the way we have broken this up for you today is to talk a little bit about the three phases, if you will, of client service interviews. It is just like preparing for a hearing, a closing, a trial, um, there's a, you know, there's a lot of prep on the front end, there's go time the day of the interview, and there's usually a lot of work, whether it's post-closing or after a matter. So we're going to walk you through this one by one. Let's start with phase one. Next slide, please. And we are assuming at this point that we've got small to mid-sized firms here on this also absolutely will resonate with a very large firm and it will resonate with a, with a solo firm. The first thing that we think you ought to do is really pull together and socialize this internally. You wanna have your partners and your support staff really bought into bringing the voice of the client into the decisions that you're making and creating some insights about how you provide service. So um, there are nine steps here, but basically what we think you should do is once you have socialized it, there's a lot of due diligence, if you will, to pull together a real snapshot of where you've been, what your client journey has looked like, um, news events of the client, revenue that you've had with the client, the types of matters that you've worked on with the client, the people that have built time to the client, how did the client learn about you and your law firm? So those are some of the things that you put together and we call that a briefing book. And once you have some, once you've socialized that this is a program that you wanna launch and you know, once you've thought about how you're going to garner information before your interview, it's time to really think a little bit about what makes the most sense in selecting who the first few interviews are gonna be with. We've seen this strategy all over the place and there's one size fits one firm. So there are some people that say, we're gonna start with our top clients. We wanna know what we're doing well and what we can do better with our top clients. There are other people that say, we're gonna to go to that middle of our client, depending on client revenue, right? Look at some of our clients that we do some work for, but we could do more. And let's really find out, are they happy with what they do? Is there a reason that they don't use us for more? And then there are those clients that we consider kind of in that bottom, you know, third or maybe even quartile of your top clients that are either at risk, they've been using you less and less, 
you know, maybe you've heard about a project or a deal or an issue that they've used a competitor for and they didn't call, it's a good time to say to yourself, maybe we should sit down and find out what we're doing well, what others are doing well, and how can we adapt to their needs. So you're going to choose the types of client, and then you're going to choose a few clients to do this with. And we would strongly suggest that the relationship partner and the billing partner are not the people that give the interview. We've seen that um, there is an ease of information sharing when they feel like they're not giving feedback that is a grade, if you will. And you can do this using consultants. Um, there may be another partner who's especially keen and has a really good um, style of matching and mirroring people, has a really high EQ that would be willing to do this. Um, lots of firms that have a marketing department use their marketing department to do this. So um, depending on what size and where you are uh, along that line depends on who will actually conduct it. And then there's a real prep of meeting with the relationship partner or the team to say, what do you think we're going to hear? What do you want to know about? Um, what kinds of questions do you want to make sure that we're asking the client? And all of that prepares you for the day of. And Jill, why don't I turn the day of over to you? Okay. Thank you. Phase two. So now that sort of all of those behind the scenes steps have been taken to prepare for the meeting, like Beth said, it's game time. And truly these client interviews are an art and a science. Beth and I do have a CLE with the ABA coming up on May 24th, where we solely focus on interview skills, you know, best practices, templates, scripts, some of the methods that you can use when connecting with someone who might be more analytical, introverted, expressive. But right now, I really do want to point out that this is the client's time to provide feedback to you. So while you can have all of these tools in your tool belt, tool belt, excuse me, and, and sort of all of these things in your back pocket in terms of, you know, the qualitative questions that you want to ask, the quantitative questions that you want to ask. And we do suggest having a little bit of both just for some consistency between interviews. It really is the client's time to share how they feel. If they want to spend the whole time talking about technology, great. If they want to spend the whole time talking about, you know, specific team members, sure. And to them, it's just an opportunity. And for you, it's the opportunity to hear what they have to say and add another touch point to the already sort of growing connecting relationship that you have. Of course, saying thank you after the conversation, while it is sort of that, that shortest sentence up there, it is the most significant. It opens the door to further conversations. It can be emailed, it can be handwritten, and it's just that added sort of touch on top to be able to reconnect to go back to them as I'll jump into in phase three on making sure that you're really following up on all the fantastic feedback that you'll get. Um, and I do really believe when you are conducting that client interview, empathizing, listening, remaining neutral, it's very easy to react when you hear something that you know for a fact might not be accurate. If they say the person's name wrong, if they say your system incorrectly, it is really just their time to let everything on the table. And the fact that they are taking the time out of their busy day is something that you can empathize with and just glean any information that you can from. So Beth and I, in our interviews, we have really had, had conversations that have run the gamut from specifically one subject, specifically one idea, connecting with different kinds of personalities, as I said, analytical, expressive, dominant driving, sort of introverted, extroverted, all of it. So, you know, this is really the shortest step in our three phases, ironically, and it really, it, it's really just about where the conversation can go and having what you need to have in your tool belt to have the conversations. And we'll so move can I, on. Can I, can I oh, call yes. out before we move on, can I call out a couple of things? One is I, I mentioned that, you know, um, I've probably been conducting client interviews for almost 30 years. And I have only had a client decline once. So there is sometimes a fear that a client will see this as a burden 
or a sales pitch. And I think it's really important that it not be a sales pitch, that it really is trying to, uh, you know, capture their opinions and try to bring that into how you're servicing your client. So the first thing I wanted to let you know is, please, as you're thinking about how you're going to uh, approach clients, know that clients appreciate this more than, than, than I think we ever expected as an industry that they would. And then the second thing is, I really want to talk about number 10, Jill, updating the briefing book the day of with client news. You know, I, I remember um, I was located in Boston and the client was located in Atlanta. And I had confirmed on a Monday that I would be heading down to Atlanta to conduct a client interview with the client, flew in on Thursday morning. And when I arrived at the client's place of business, went into a conference room, he started and he gushed how much it meant to him that I still came down and still conducted the client interview after such a terrible week that he had had and wanted to know what the partners that he worked with thought about him being fired the day before. And we didn't know. We hadn't done step number 10, Jill. We hadn't done a quick, you know, Google search of the person's name and the company name to make sure that nothing overnight terrible had happened that we needed to know about. So I just, uh, it seems almost administrative, number 10. It is incredibly important. And I would also say, as you're thinking a little bit about these client interviews and thinking about uh, creating that preliminary report, I think it's important to take time in your calendar the day of or even the evening of your client interview and capturing as much as you can in the report. Um, and that thank you note is my last, uh, my last uh, interjection here is not just thank you. It's thank you, we heard you, you know, give a nod to some of what you heard. Um, you know, we understand that we're not sending out our bills, you know, in a cycle that works for your finance and billing department, or we understand that um, we're not providing cell numbers for people after hours. And we're gonna talk about that. Whatever it is that the client is suggesting might not be something that you want to do, but that you want to go back and talk about, making sure that there's a few things in that thank you note that really illustrate we heard you and thank you is, is an important piece of that thank you note. Mm -hmm. And yes, and these generally, um, you know, as number 11 says, these generally, we, you know, you can ask for 45 minutes to an hour. They generally last more than an hour because the client can't stop talking, um, you know, given the opportunity to talk about what other firms do or, you know, their opportunity to give a real shout out to somebody that they've worked with at your firm um, or the way they've experienced something that we might look past. You know, I remember being in an interview with somebody saying, I knew I liked your firm the day I was in the reception area and everybody that walked by each other they had nice things to say. They were acknowledging each other. People looked happy. People were walking in groups. Um, you know, it told me a lot about your culture sort of thing. So even that kind of information being able to bring back is really important. Please. I totally agree too about the day of, and also sneak, speaking of sort of the smaller things that, that, you know, you might not be immediately thinking about, but don't go to a Dunkin' Donuts client interview with a Starbucks cup in your hand or sort of just kind of having that common sense and those sort of added things to think about um, also make a very significant difference. Next slide, please. Now I want to move. I want to add something to that, Jill. Yeah. I, I can't tell you how many times a CEO has looked at me when there is a free subscription or a subscription to a blog or a newsletter or an RSS feed or that says he or she would say, have you subscribed to, you know, our news feed? Have you, you know, some of these easy things? Um, 
So yes, thinking a little bit about their business, their products, and make sure that you go in with some type of supportive answer, I think is really important. And it's just good business practice. 100%. So phase three in our 20-step client interview process after the client service interview, this is where I say the work is just beginning. Um, after saying thank you, it's, it's really time to hit the ground running and make sure that you're logging all of those common themes, things that um, the client had said are their true priorities or those low hanging fruits in terms of those little things that you're able to do right away, like Beth mentioned. If you're not subscribed or you wanna further subscribe to something or you wanna you know, get them on a list or they ask for an invitation, all of those small things that you can be doing right away are those first things that you wanna do when you go back to the firm or when you finish your client service interview after saying thank you. It's also very critical that you're staying connected with that relationship attorney and with that billing attorney you had your prep session with them. You know what they want to know. You've gotten answers for them. You're able to connect with those attorneys following the interview, and you can just let them know how it went. I think it's the time, too, where you can you know, share a quick update on how the, how the interview went while you go back and do a deeper dive into those reports of the common themes that you've heard, the issues, the metrics from the data that you've asked um, consistently across interviews as well. And also suggesting those actionable follow-up strategies. You know, if the client is upset about bills, maybe we need to have a follow-up 100%. We need to have a follow-up conversation about that. So just pulling out that information and also acting on that information. Yes, we need to say we heard you in that thank you, but then you have to act on it. If you don't act on it, it it's worse than not asking for the feedback in the first place. And so you're really wanting to make sure in those you know, 24 hours after you have the interview, you are taking down everything that you need to in order that, to then create a more robust follow-up strategy. So I also think that communication and the feedback that you're getting, it really, you know, depending on the information, should of course go to the relationship attorney. And then there's information that, that might be great to share with attorneys beyond that or the practice area. If you're meeting with a real estate client and they give you some really fascinating advice as to the life sciences industry, you should bring that back to the firm and share that with the firm and think about you know, ways where you can best position yourself and your website and your attorneys who might be thinking about other areas of real estate and, and where there might be growth or opportunity just getting that you know, macro information back to your firm to, to sort of help institutionalize some knowledge or some updates. You know, this information directly from the client's voice, and, and by the way, the clients that you're meeting with are the decision makers in their firms and, and choose to work with you and work with you. So this is sort of the most critical information that you're able to come back with. Um, Jill, yeah, oh, I was gonna say, Jill, can, can we pause here for a minute and just, just give a few examples of the kinds of questions that folks can talk to their clients about. Yeah. Um, so you talked a little bit at the beginning about there's qualitative and quantitative feedback in client interviews. So um, when you start off a client interview, um, only because I, I know you, you always start off by saying to a client, I have some prepared questions that I can ask you, or we can start with what you telling me a little bit about you and your company and your relationship with the firm. Yeah. And is it 50, 50 that the clients say, well, let me start, or is it, please go ahead. Like how often does, does do the clients just start versus saying, please give me your list. Totally 50, 50. I think as long as you're letting the client decide how they okay. want to proceed, it is 50-50. And right. some of those open-ended questions that I think you know you can use or slot in to kind of help guide the conversation. I'll give you a few of my favorites um, in terms of gleaning some, some really good information. Um, what is the top piece of advice that you would give to our junior attorneys who are just starting out at the firm and in this industry? What does responsiveness mean to you? Um, if you think about the direction of your company in the next six months, 12 months, year, five years, 
what direction are you going? What are your priorities and how can we help you get there? Um, and, and I would say, you know, if you have those questions, as we've talked about in your back pocket, you'll be able to really weave them into the conversation. Some of the, the data and the metrics that we ask, um, we ask simply on a scale of one to 10, how would you rate us? Um, would you, in terms of our billing and our rates, are they higher than market? Are they at market? Are they under market? And, and it's about how the client perceives it. We also ask about value. So is our value that we're bringing to you higher than market, at market, below market? We ask if they agree, if they strongly agree, if they disagree, that the firm makes their lives easier. Um, and so I think, you know, being able to have some consistency, we also talk about our net promoter score. So on a scale of one to 10 or, or one to five, I, I know different places do it differently. How likely are you to recommend us? Have you recommended us? And getting that information as well is is can very you, helpful. And can you pause there for a minute because um, a net promoter score is a really interesting tool, um, and I've seen this used in surveys as well as client interviews, and as well I've seen them used in end of matter debriefs. A net promoter score gives the person who's asking the question or the company that's asking the question some uh, scientifically proven information about the satisfaction of the person that they're asking. So when a law firm says, on a scale of one to 10, how likely are you to refer ABC law firm to, um, to, to refer them to someone? If that answer is a nine or a 10, they're very satisfied. If it's a seven or an eight, you have some work to do. And so spend some time probing during the client service interview. And basically, if it's six below, it's they say it's just a matter of time. If you don't fix what's broken, that the customer or the client, depending on whether you're a law firm or a product company, is going to leave. And that this runs the trend of professional services, consumer goods, we see that question a lot um, when we take surveys. How likely are you to refer us to, you know, to someone? And so a net promoter score being thrown into your client interview, I think, is a great way to decide mid-interview, do I need to keep probing? Do I need to keep asking some questions? If they say things are good, they're not perfect, but they're good, and then gives you a net promoter score of seven, um, it's a good time to say to yourself uh, or for the person who's conducting the client interviews to say, tell me a little bit more. Sometimes it's easier for them to tell you what other law firms do well than to tell you what, you're, what, you're, what their lawyer doesn't do well. And so that's also a way to get to Think about a law firm that over, you know, that basically exceeds your expectations. Think of a lawyer that you work with. Tell me about what he or she does differently that really stands out to you. And then those very attributes that they talk about, you know, um, Jill is always available. Um, she really understands my risk profile in this matter. Um, she's easy to work with, whatever the, the ways that, that the attributes that they use to describe, capture them because a little later on in the interview, you want to go back and say, let's go back to some of the attributes that, that you mentioned earlier. How would you rate us in terms of accessibility, excellent, good, fair, or poor? How would you rate us on um, understanding your risk profile in your in your matters or your deals, excellent, good or profile. So the things that they have said, these are really important to me, and this is what I think really matters. Finding out how you're doing, stacked against those, is much more important than the arbitrary list of attributes because the client might say, from a technology standpoint, I think you you're average, but I but you know but they don't care. That, you're, that the technology is average. They really care that you represent them and that you're an extension of them when you're at the table. And that's way more important than the technology that you're using. So try in these client interviews to get the qualitative and the quantitative 
um, but use some indicators that you can go back to later on in the discussion and talk a little bit about what's important and how you're doing. And then I, I know that you're going to continue on um, in, in a minute to talk about, but tell me, tell us what does the plan look like? So you bring back a report and a plan. Can you just describe that a little bit as we talk about implementing it? Absolutely. Well, I think first, when you bring back that plan, depending on what you hear from those client interviews, and I, I want to add, don't be afraid as well to be direct when having those client interviews and you're asking your questions. One of my other favorites is to very straightforwardly ask, what more can we be doing off the clock to, to add value? Do you need CLEs? Would you like a presentation for all the new folks who have recently joined? We're happy to do a training since we have a lot of institutional knowledge. So I also think as it does relate to the report and next steps, they might identify some really concrete items that they would really like from you and your law firm. And that absolutely needs to go on the report. And as Beth mentioned, that also needs to go on that thank you note we hear you, we're looking forward to giving this presentation, you know, we'll work with you on scheduling a time and place. So really that report is including uh, the big themes, the action items, prioritizing those action items. So the low hanging fruits or, or those direct asks really need to be addressed first. And of course the relationship attorney needs to have that consensus with what you are suggesting. And sometimes it's a, you know, a conversation where you share the feedback and your recommendations. And sometimes it's more than that. Sometimes you do might need to pull in your IT group or security if there's talking about some technology conversations, or you might need to pull in the client relations events team or think about events and, and be able to follow up on that. So I think the report will look different depending on what the goals are and what um, feedback that you hear. Of course, keeping it consistent, as I mentioned, across the data, also asking about specific team members, that's some confidential information. You want to make sure where you're storing it or how you're reporting it and how you're sharing it can have some sort of modified access or security or, you know, pulling out the broad themes to share, as I mentioned, maybe broader and more institutionally with the firm or with your colleagues, and then maybe keeping that more secure information closer to yourself or for professional development purposes, things like that. Um, I know we, we do have some questions in it, and then I just wanna add that that last number five on the right side, maintaining that feedback loop. So as you're acting and as you're carrying out those feedback items that, that you really do wanna act on and make sure the client knows that, that we're working on, it's very important to keep that open communication with the client and to check in again in six months and make sure that, that things are going well. Um, and between those six months, checking in internally and making sure we're on track to deliver that CLE, deliver that training, have that event, staying on top of the client's news, staying on top of people moves. Did the general counsel go somewhere? Do we need to do this again? I think that's something that you know can, can be forgot upon after you do the interview. And that's why I said in phase three, it's it's really where the real work begins and making sure you're, again, you're acting and acting is maintaining that feedback loop as well. Beth, I know you've seen this a couple of times, many times that, you know, you do have to act and you do have to maintain that loop. And it also shows when you do that, you can replicate it with other clients and other interviews in terms of, you know, this group, 68% don't have a formal client interview and in, program in place and sort of being able to use client interviews as a case study to do the next one, showing that success that you've had is, is all the more critical. Sure. No, absolutely. And it is a differentiator, right? Um, it is a differentiator. You know, years, um, I, I want to turn to just a couple of questions and spend a few minutes on them. One of the questions that we had during the session was, do you ever record the interviews? And boy, I was at a consulting firm more than 25 years ago, and this was one of the services that this consulting firm provided to law firms long ago. And the request was the law firm wanted them to be recorded. Um, and after the seventh decline, 
seven out of seven decline of the attorney saying, I'm, I mean, the client saying, I'm not comfortable with you recording it. Happy to answer your questions. Happy for you to take notes. Um, we stopped asking. Over the years, I don't think that has changed. I think that clients, um, you know, when you sit down for the interview, we didn't we didn't talk a little bit ab ab about this, and we maybe we should touch on it very quickly here because we just have a few minutes. But when we sit down for interviews, it's really important to tell the clients what the interview is not. This is not a scorecard on the attorneys you're with. This is not a review that's going to impact comp. This is not a sales pitch for us to sell you more business. This is not, I mean, it's very important to be clear about what it is not. Um, as you talk a little bit about why you're, why you're investing some time in hearing about the clients. And basically there's a very clear way to say, we know that client needs are constantly changing and we wanna make sure that we know what those changes are so that we can change either with you or ahead of you um, and have some preventative services in place for you. So that it's really about the client ultimately because the client interviews, yes, it improves client service, therefore it improves your revenue and your profitability. But if you're doing it just for improving your profitability and revenue, it won't work. It, it it's really truly has to be about improving your client service. We also had another question about an attorney who is interested in um, providing estate planning as their next chapter. And I'm, by the way the, the question is posed, I think that he or she plans to be solo um, attorney and thought that maybe some of the, the statistics that we put up about one time legal one you know using legal work one time that the client will be gone um, in three years, and um, this it, it, it's interesting because if you are in fact uh, a solo practitioner and only do trust and estates, does that mean that you are going to have a group? two or three other attorneys that do other things, you know, um, so that when you're a client, because once you actually represent them as their trust and estates attorney, they think that you're their attorney um, until you tell them otherwise. And so when there's an employment issue um, that you've got a network of people that you can say, I have a colleague that I can introduce you to, um, you know, those sorts of networks can act as several services across a particular law firm. So, you know, solo and small firms, and I know that this is, I'm overstating this for illustrative purposes, you would never say this, but I'm sorry, I only do trust and estates, therefore I cannot help you with anything beyond that. Those are, you would never say those words, I understand, but the way you could say it is, I have a network, you know, these are people that um, I know, I trust, get good results, that sort of thing, um, and use that as a way to help your client that you're doing conducting trust and estates work for in other areas that he or she may need some help in, right? It could be a divorce. It could be, there's all sorts of needs that they might may have. So keeping a professional network close to you and in turn, those people will also be able to, um, to use you um, as a way to stay close to their clients and help them beyond. I also want to add that we've done many client interviews with trust and estates clients. So these client interviews aren't, you know, prohibited for, for certain clientele or businesses only or, or sort of on that corporate side or litigation side only. It's, if anything, a, a great opportunity to connect on a more personal level. I also think that um, when I think about that statistic in the earlier slide that this attendee has asked about in terms of needing to diversify because it, it could, you know, create more revenue and create more loyalty. I think of the word stickiness and that connection and the stickier you are, the more loyal the client, the 
more you know revenue coming in the future the more connection creating that stickiness so so like that said even just having the network or being that go-to and staying connected and being able to get them information that they may need that you might not provide but you being that go-to this that that's the real thick of it the stickiness thank you so um i think we can move to um, the next slide just um, in the interest of time um, is there a slide after we've talked a little bit about the client service interview playbook but we just wanted to summarize a little bit for everybody you know we wanted to make sure that we gave you uh, a compelling business case about why you want to ask for your client's advice about how to improve your client service. Um, we also wanted to, you know, give you some different types of feedback because client interviews aren't for everyone. Um, again, you can, you can absolutely have these after action reviews or start with a survey. Um, again, there are lots of consultants out there on this. And if you just want to shoot Jill or I a quick uh, message on LinkedIn, we can give you the name of a couple of consultants that do this. Um, we, we do not, by the way, <laughs> this is not what we do. Um, so there are, um, there are definitely ways that, that you can implement, but we also just wanted to remind people about, you know, some of the risk and the consequences for having clients that think that service is an issue because with social media, the online, the reviews, the chat rooms, um, it's, it's, Again, it's, it's hard to uh, change a perception um, as it is to create one. And then we also just wanted to give you a real in-depth look at, in a short period of time, that client interviews is an investment. It's not just a one-time meeting. Um, you know, there's a lot of prep time that needs to happen. You and your firm, no matter your size, whether there's two of you or whether there's 2,000 of you, everybody needs to be on board because you need to be willing to respond to the clients. And I have had clients say to me time after time, uh, the only thing that could be worse than not asking what you can fix is asking and then not fix it. Um, so the reason we keep talking about it's really important to socialize this and spend a lot of time up front is because if a client is asking for you to change a billing cycle, to change the way you're communicating, to change um, the people that are on their team, um, those kinds of changes are real, they're material. And so uh, you need to make sure that you're really bought into this before, before you do it. Um, the other thing that I would say, even if you're gonna start with an end of matter debrief, completely appropriate for the attorney who was working on a matter or a deal to ask the client at the end, hey, how did we do? We'd like to close and we suggest that everybody close with what question didn't I ask that I should have? Um, and it really is a little bit of a catch-all. It's a great question to ask at the end of any service interaction with your client. Um, so if there were some things that they were prepared to talk about, but that you didn't prompt or ask, it gives them permission to share a little bit about, well, you know, I was talking with my colleague, Jennifer, and one of the things that she mentioned, and it gives them an opportunity in a doorway. So we would also, as you're having your summary conversations with your clients and ending with, is there something that we didn't talk about and something that I didn't ask you about that I should have, is always a great way to end. And the 20 steps, it's 20 steps, it's a big commitment, but we truly believe um, that there's real value and again, a real differentiator in doing this. So I don't know if there are any other questions. Let me check one more time. I was gonna um, say in the spirit of practicing what we preach and asking the audience if there is any questions that they have that we might not have gotten to answer today, please don't hesitate to to ask it now, or, or I think there's a next slide with our LinkedIn information. You can pull out your phones, connect with us, shoot us a note. 
we have a lot of stories, a lot of anecdotes, a lot of interest, obviously, in the subject. And we just think it's it's the biggest differentiator by by adding tremendous value to to what you do every day already. So happy to talk about it further now or later. Okay, good. Well, then I think that is a wrap. And again, thank you, Christian, Kristen and Sasha and the ABA and the attendees and be well. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much. That is all the time we have for today. I'd like to thank everyone for attending our marketing mastermind session. I would also like to thank Jill and Beth for presenting today. We will now conclude the webinar. Bye, everyone.